ideas to one another. Either we must confine ourselves to propositions which are actually explicit in this respect, or in which the data at hand uh, are to make them explicit. Or we must feign such a knowledge where we have it not, which would, of course, still be more objectionable. Uh, This is from an article entitled On the Diagrammatic and Mechanical Representations of Propositions and Reasoning by one John Venn, an English mathematician, a philosopher responsible for popularizing the use of simple closed curves drawn on one plane to illustrate the relationship between things like probability logic or even computer science. And uh, obviously, I think we're pretty well acquainted with then systems of diagramming these logical associations. We use it in our business. We use it in our science. um, We use it in our humor. But what's interesting to me from this initial description is that he really didn't seem to have a whole lot of faith in this structure as he was describing it. And I'm going to tell you tonight, as I uh, preach to you, I share this sort of uh, insufficiency. I don't know that the method by which I'm going to talk to you tonight about our topic at hand is very sufficient uh, to do what I'm doing. I'm a pretty confident believer that this tool, uh, namely like sermon, preaching, back and forth, is woefully inadequate compared to the everyday engagements that you, as a congregation, deal with on a daily basis. So, the question that I present to you this evening, and the one that I'm going to attempt to answer to the best of my ability using the scripture, is what do we share? What things do we have in common? Um, I think the scripture gives us a pretty good answer to this question, and I think it does it in our text that I've chosen. So let's look at Romans chapter 15. Uh, We'll look in verse 1 to begin. It says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the taunts of those who taunt you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant to you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one purpose and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think these verses give us three things in particular that we can focus on, uh, that we share, things that we have in common. And it's my idea to highlight these for you this evening. The first thing that I think the passage says that we share is in this notion, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. I think scripture is designed to unify us around a common culture. Uh, The stories in scripture serve as our shared history. They serve as our spiritual heritage And ultimately, they become, I think, the stories that we tell uh, not only about ourselves, but to one another. We we recount these things to each other. I I grew up loving American history, uh, probably as some of you in the audience did. Um, Figures like Washington and Lafayette ended up becoming just as big and as important in my mind, you know, as someone like Superman. Um, I I can't overemphasize just how cool I thought these guys were. And, And while I would never argue that my personal understanding of American history is Uh, perfect or complete. I think there's obviously room for nuance and uh, for competing narratives. It's really become increasingly obvious to me that part of the reason our country is in such turmoil is because we no longer uh, have a shared culture. We no longer have a shared history. Um, Different disparate groups of people no longer share the same uh, common historical narrative. We, we don't share the same guiding principles as one another. We frequently don't have the same societal goals in mind. We don't talk about the country in the same way as our neighbors do. And that can be for better or for worse. Um, I don't really need to elaborate, I think, on that for you to understand what I'm saying. Wh- whatever, whatever example you're thinking of right now to illustrate the point, that, that's sufficient. But you can understand that, that turmoil in our country. Imagine that same problem within the church. Uh, and imagine that same problem in these very walls. Imagine what sort of division uh, we might have in the church if we don't have a common story, if we don't share a common heritage, and if we aren't aiming for the same end point. What hope do we have to progress in that case? Uh, Probably not very much uh, of one. The scriptures are designed in order to give us that hope, as it says, uh, through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures. And I think biblical figures understood this principle pretty strongly. The Hebrew nation and its prosperity was very obviously built on a tradition that was handed down from father to son, from mother to daughter. 
And we can see examples of that in Deuteronomy, uh, in the, the speeches that Moses gives to the people as they're about to enter into the country. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, if you kind of look there at near the end, or uh, I'm sorry, not 13, chapter 30, uh, near the end of Moses' speeches, in verse 15, he begins to lay some of this out. He says, See, I have placed before you today life and happiness, death and adversity, and I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, so that you may live and become numerous, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to take possession of it. If your heart turns away and you will not obey, but allow yourself to be led astray, and you worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you will certainly perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and take possession of it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have placed before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and holding close to him. For this is your life and the length of your days, so that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Just as God made a covenant with the Hebrews at the mountain, um, as they were getting ready to enter into the land, Moses is calling them to renew that covenant, or make a new covenant with them even, um, as this new group, this new generation is entering into the land. They understood that this tradition of following God and his commandments had been passed down all the way from Abram um, to Isaac to Jacob. I think King David also is a good example of understanding the the shared common culture um, that comes out of following God's commandments. Obviously, in Psalm 119, he writes a a, a huge uh, love letter to the Scriptures. But particularly in in Psalm 119 and verse 11, David says, I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. It's pretty obvious, I think, that King David delighted in the teachings of God, so much so that it colored every single one of his writings— Um, And those writings, you know, we read them today, and it stands as a testament to the nation that was shaped by those commands in the Hebrew nation, um, and also the greatness of the man that helped to do it uh, in King David and his time as a leader. I think Paul also wanted early Christians to understand this common culture that they shared as well. Uh, In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, he writes to his audience saying, He, being God, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure— which he set forth in him regarding his plan of the fullness of the times, to bring all things together in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him we have also obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things in accordance with the plan of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in the Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, After listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is a first installment of our inheritance, in regards to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. It it would appear to me uh, almost self-evident that Paul desperately wanted Christians to understand the immensity of the tradition in which their faith was intended to be rooted. Um, That inheritance, right, that reward to which they are entitled was designed by God and presented in the truth of the gospel. And the coolest thing about that is is we get to be a part of that as well. The church didn't end in Ephesus. It has persisted to this day. Um, We we can share in the eternal effort of the creator in all of his glorious work. And and if that doesn't produce hope in us, like the scripture indicates here in Romans, I, I don't know what will. Um, that, that is incredible to me that something that has lasted this long and will continue to last long beyond uh, the end of my life is something that I get to, to be a small part of. So I think the scriptures are dedicated to encouraging us with this common culture, this tradition that we get to be a part of all the way from uh, the promises made to Abraham um, to the death of Christ on the cross and the work of the church afterwards. Now the scripture I think gives us some other things here in Romans that uh, we can share. It's not just a common culture that we share, uh, but the scripture also says in Romans, now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another. I think scripture is designed to unify us around a common community. God's boons through scripture show us who we ought to be in a large part through practice, through command, and through example. Uh, And I think what it shows us is that we're meant to be together. Uh, obviously, an example of this, a, uh, a common teaching amongst the early Christians is found in 1 John chapter 1. 
where John writes to his audience, he says in verse 5, this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Um, Obviously, we can't have any fellowship with those who are outside of the light, if we intend to walk in the light. And as we walk in the light, we find that fellowship, that community with one another and with Jesus as well. I'm sure I probably don't have to explain to you, you're probably well aware of this, that that level of unity, that level of togetherness is probably going to come with an incredible amount of difficulty. Um, It's hard to achieve a, a cohesive community. It's hard to put people together. I mean, the, the, the more people you put together to make a decision, the harder it becomes, right? I think this seems particularly acute in light of our society, which has a, ha- a habit of emphasizing larger and larger and larger communities, um, almost unintentionally, I think. I, I'm not entirely sure we were ever really meant to live in such a large, connected world. I, I don't know that for a fact. That's just my opinion. Um, But our connection to people all all over the world via something as complex as the internet or even as simple as distant relationships um, makes these appeals to larger communities almost natural in our our modern world. I'm not convinced it's always to our benefit. There is something to be said about small communities um, and small places where we can be together. The community required by the church is something that I think that makes it unique. Um, Personally, I I don't know honestly how people move across the country without having that natural community to fall into. It must be very, very difficult. Um, I'm very grateful that in in all of the places that I've moved and live, I've been privileged to meet excellent Christians in all those places, and I I trust that will continue. I I hope that will be your experience as you, you know, whether you're here or whether you're a student and you leave this place and you go to another church, I hope you'll find good Christians to to associate with. The truth you already understand as an audience is that every deeply, for every deeply fulfilling relationship you have with Christians, there's going to be equally as many uh, prickly and like difficult to manage relationships as well. well uh, one of my favorite writers, Chesterton, has this to say about communities and particularly small ones. He says, it's not fashionable to say now much a day of the advantages of a small community. We're told that we must go in for large empires and, and large ideas There is one advantage, however, in a small state, the city or the village, which only the willfully blind can overlook. The man who lives in small communities lives in a much larger world. He knows much more of the fierce varieties and uncompromising divergences of men, and the reason for this is obvious. In a large community, we can choose our companions. In a small community, our companions are chosen for us. Thus, in all extensive and highly civilized societies, groups come into existence founded upon what is called sympathy and shut out the real world more sharply than the gates of a monastery. A big society is a society for the promotion of narrowness, and it is a machinery for the purpose of guarding the solitary and sensitive individual from all experience of the bitter and bracing of human compromises. It is, in the most literal sense of the word, a society for the prevention of Christian knowledge." It seems to me that in his writing here, he, he's suggesting that our modern desire to fold into larger communities can rob us of the natural difficulties that we're going to have in just being together. If you want to be a part of a Christian family and you expect to never have any friction with people, I don't think that's a realistic idea of how people are or how they interact. Um, being in pro- close, close proximity with one another, uh, I- encourage us to get to know what those rough edges are going to be um, I'm sure my wife, for example, knows all of the le- like least pleasant things about me, um, probably more so than any of you in this room. And, and you're going to have that same experience with one another as you get to know each other. You're going to become intimately acquainted with one another's failings. Um, and hopefully, you're going to be intimately acquainted with how to help fill in those failings for one another as well. As you know, I can tell you, my wife is certainly very good at doing that. She's good at helping me figure out, here, you're not thinking straight, or, or here, you're not approaching this with the right attitude. Um, ideally, we do these things for one another. These behavior problems, these neuroses might become obstacles in our relationships with, with one another, and we're going to have trouble living together well. But as the scripture tells us, being of one mind is worth it anyway. We need to make our relationships with one another a top priority. We need to accept that disappointments are going to happen. Um, We need to assume the best of one another in every instance that we possibly can. 
We need to avoid shutting one another out and blaming each other um, instead of taking responsibility for our own actions. We need to learn how to be fully present with one another instead of distracted by outside forces. We need to learn to forgive one another. Uh, We need to learn to not hold grudges. We need to learn what sorts of things our brothers and sisters need in order to feel loved and welcomed. And that's going to be probably very different for different people. Um, What you need to feel welcomed and accepted is probably not going to be the same thing that the person next to you might need. We must consider one another in these things and and not just trample upon each other, uh, but instead encourage one another to lift each other up. If through weakness uh, we judge each other or if we censor each other or if we speak evil of one another, um, we're really only going to be hurting ourselves in that matter. So we must bear, I think, with each other even in these moments. The writer of Psalms in Psalm 69, in verse 7, prays, May those who seek you not be dishonored because of me. God of Israel, because for your sake I have endured disgrace. And the psalmist, I think, experienced that. And I think Jesus stands as a perfect example of that attitude as well. He fulfilled these standards. Um, Christ bore with his weak disciples and their relational failures. And he's the ultimate example of one who did not please himself. He put others first. So I want you to imagine, um, put yourself in Jesus' shoes as you walk through uh, what happens to him as he goes to his, his death. He takes abuse. He suffers wrong for God's glory. And all of his friends abandon him. They, they leave him. Peter denies him vocally in front of people. And yet Christ humbles himself and becomes obedient to the death, even on the cross. So we get then to John chapter 21, and we find a scene where Jesus, after resurrecting, is sitting with his disciples on the beach. He's having breakfast, and he begins to have a conversation with Peter. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 15. Imagine this scene. Uh, The soft light of morning is coming down. The waves are lapping against the shoreline. There's a crackling of a fire, and, and the meal is ending. And here, when they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again, a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. This is is probably one of the first few intimate conversations that Christ and Peter have been able to have, maybe barring a couple other gatherings, um, since his denial. And I, I think Christ is very... Uh, thoughtful in asking this question, do you love me? He's giving Peter an opportunity to rescind his denial. And as Peter affirms his love for Christ in each of these moments, Jesus' response is, I have something for you to do. Tend my sheep. Look after my flock. This is part of what a community does for each other. We we look after one another. Um, And I think our elders do that, obviously. Our shepherds, they are responsible for that task, but you sitting in the pew are responsible for that as well. There's going to be many opportunities for you to do that, whether it is in this building. Uh, certainly parents, you, you tend after your family, you look after your children. Um, students, you look after one another as you're at school, uh, and you look after one another as you're at work as well. And that's the thing about a community is that with a community comes a task, comes a work. And I think that's the third thing that this passage here in Romans indicates to us that we share. Uh, With one purpose and with one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture is designed to unify us around a common cause. Together, we are dedicated to the task of bringing honor to God and carrying his message. Um, We're not called to be an idle people. And and I fear that sometimes we, uh, you know, not Twin Cities specifically, the church, uh, are, can, can be guilty of that. At least I, I thir- think, uh, thir- certainly think that I am often guilty of that. Uh, it can be difficult to adequately describe what that work is going to be, and it's, it's difficult to know if you're even doing it sometimes. Probably the, the difficulty in, in identifying what the nature of the work of the church is supposed to be is because the spiritual needs of our congregation and, and of our, our fellow Christians uh, is going to ebb and flow from time to time, just like uh, the you know, the waves on that, that beach at breakfast. Um, 
I think the passage does give us some indication of what that work is intended to be. It says with one voice, right? The, 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 the work is going to be a vocal one. It's going to require us to give full-throated attention to the uplifting of the Lord in all his greatness and serving the needs of his people, tending his sheep, uh, looking after what they need. So part of this work obviously involves the spreading of the gospel. I think that's a primary thing that we understand as being engaged in that common cause. Romans chapter 1 Uh, In verse 16, at the beginning of Paul's message there, uh, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. I mean, I believe that the gospel is spread in this building. Um, It's spread from this pulpit by many able-bodied speakers. It's, uh, well, not me excluded. Uh, It's spread by our wise Bible class teachers. Um, It's spread by many of you in the pew as you engage with one another. Um, One of my favorite pieces of advice, or or one of the ones that at least comes to mind most often, is I had a mentor once tell me that I need to preach the gospel to myself daily. I think we ought to be doing that. We need to be reminding ourselves of the gospel, the good message there, and sharing it with one another as well. The work is going to be a personal one, right? It's something that happens uh, in your own heart. It happens in your own home. It's going to happen in your community, whatever that community ends up looking like, whether it's the people within this wall or or those who are in constant contact with you as well. You must offer praise to God, and you must do what you can to aid those who are around you in doing the same. There's encouragement in Philippians chapter 2. Paul there writes to the Philippian church, In verse 12 saying, So then, my beloved, as just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining or without arguments, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless, innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you will appear as lights in the world, holding firmly to the word of life, so that on the day of Christ I can take pride because I did not run in vain nor labor in vain. There's a task that's being given to those people um, to tend to themselves, uh, to look after their own salvation with fear and trembling, to do things without complaining. That can be very, very difficult sometimes. Um, And to look after one another as well. So I think that's a couple things that we share. That's what I'd say I see in the passage. It's, It's two verses. Um, almost a throwaway thought that's given by Paul in this moment, but it carries a lot of richness, I think, and a lot of uh, things that we can take away from it. It's a pretty clever design, I think. Obviously, I didn't come up with it. I think the diagram works to help see how things are associated. I think we share these things, and if I had to, I'd probably draw the church right there in that very small thing. If I was going to draw any church, I'd probably draw the Twin City Church in the very middle there. It's kind of interesting if you go on to read the rest of that article uh, by the, the English uh, gentleman, Mr. Venn. He writes near the end of that paper, he's saying, I have no high estimate myself of the interest or importance of what are sometimes called logical machines. In the first place, it is very seldom that intricate logical calculations are practically forced upon us. It's rather we who look about for complicated examples in order to illustrate our rules and our methods. I wonder if, if he'd still feel the same way <laughs> Uh, if he could see today just how much uh, you know, his, his little logic machine has influenced us. We use it for our, uh, all sorts of things, right? It's become quite, uh, quite useful. And, and like Vin, I don't really hold myself as any grand paragon of unification. Um, I really, I'm just trying to see the, the pattern for what it is and, and uh, trying to see it to the best of my ability. Really, I, I see it from your example. Right? I, I see you sharing these things, and I'm trying to do my part to put it into place. And, and I would ask that you join me in doing those things because <clears throat> I desperately need these things. I desperately need common culture. I need to know where I've come from and what I get to be a part of. I need a common community. I, I need a place to be. I need people to uplift me and carry me forward when I'm weak. Um, and I need a common cause. I need work to do lest I become idle and self-destructive. I think if you're like me, you probably need those things too. Um, which is a testament to why you're here. So uh, what I am confident of is that God who gives perseverance and encouragement can grant us to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ, so that with one purpose and one voice, we too 
may glorify the God and Father. Um, and I would ask, as we move forward, that you join me in doing those things. We're going to have a song now. We're going to conclude our services, and I pray that if you have some public need, please make it known. Uh, if you don't have a public need, if you have a private need, please make it known. Uh, the community is here to do these things. We desperately want to serve Christ, and we pray that you would join us in doing those things. Let us sing. My hope.